Phyllis Smith is the voice of sadness in the new Pixar film, Inside Out. She's with me right here in Studio Q. Hello. Hello. Very uh, great pleasure of oh, mine to chat with thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so you voiced sadness I in the did. film. Why did you want that, that part? Um, that's what they offered me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, uh, with a, a Pixar movie, uh, you know, any role is great. And um, actually, when I went, to, they invited me up to Emeryville. Um, I, Pete Doctor has been mm-hmm. here, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, Pete and uh, Jonas Rivera, the executive producer, they uh, invited me to come up to their playground at the Pixar uh, campus. And uh, uh, I was very happy to to go. And they presented the, the idea of the film to me mm-hmm. and uh, said that they thought they'd like for me to play Sadness. So I said, yes, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> what, would, what would be your second pick of emotion to play? Oh, I think they got it right with sadness, <laughs> but uh, let's see. I don't know. I think, I'd imagine anger would be great for comedy. I was going to say right? anger is, is pretty funny and disgust mm. is, you know, they're all, you can all play with a lot, you know, with each of the emotions. But I think they got it right on their casting with, you know, Amy and Bill and Lewis and Mindy. So, How would you characterize the relationship between joy and sadness in the film? Well, I think that um, sadness and joy, they really don't know what sadness's um, purpose is in the beginning. I think they're, um, they're, they're kind of exploring that together. And it's a, it's a lovely moment in the film when joy actually realizes that there is a, you know, <laughs> other than just being annoying, that sadness does have a purpose. Yeah. And... Um, uh, I always teasingly said that I was like Joy's ball and chain around her ankle. Um, and in, I don't know if Pete uh, mentioned this or not, but in the beginning it was not joy and sadness. It was joy and fear that he thought would be the pair. Mm-hmm. Did he mention that to you? He said, no. uh, I, I didn't know about it during the uh, actual working on the film. I found out about it after the fact, which okay. I'm kind of glad I did. I actually heard about it, overheard it at a lunch that Pete was having when he was talking to someone else. And then I read about it in an article where in the initial idea of the film, he thought that joy and fear was the pair that needed to be um, managed. Matched, and he felt that something wasn't quite, you know, cohesive. Mm-hmm. And he went to his house and he um, started thinking about the fact that he might get fired. And he's st- having all these sad moments of, of um, you know, the possibility if he did get fired, he was going to mix his miss his Pixar family. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, the it dawned on him that it. The, ma- the match that should have been paired up was joy and sadness. It's such an interesting question because I found myself watching the film going, what is the purpose of sadness? Well, I think in this particular instance, you know, sadness, the character of sadness wants the best for Riley. Her, her whole intent is for, the, for Riley to have the best, uh, th- you know, things go on in her life. And... So I think it's the intent of sadness's heart mm. that bring out the best in the other emotions. Um, and, you know, we all, we all are a conglomerate of emotions, and, and this film points out that there is definitely a place for the emotion of sadness to be expressed in order to, to make one feel whole. Yeah. Um, to make one feel better if they're able to talk about it, or um, yeah, there's a, there's a honesty that in the film it comes mm-hmm. out of sadness and closeness with others. With right, right. and mm-hmm. and uh, I think there's a I love the moment when sadness has a conversation with uh, Bing Bong, and Joy realizes I think that's the one of the pivotal points when Joy realizes oh there's something that's a little, you know, sadness has some relevance here Mm -hmm. to some degree, but she's not quite sure at that point what's going on with it. But uh, it's like the beginning of her revelation that sadness, we all have, you know, it's good for us to express that. There's there's a use for it somewhere. Have you ever found, is there a moment in your life where you found sadness has offered you something in terms of closeness with another person or made you more reflective? I, I think so. I mean, sadness... 
Sadness is um, like I have some things that are issues that are going on. You know, we don't need to discuss them on national radio and stuff, but um, it does make you take stock of your what you've what you've done, uh, what you haven't done, uh, what you need to do with, you know, in particular if it's about um, the possibility of losing, you know, a loved one to sickness or whatever. And um, so, you know, absolutely, it, you, if you're a thinking person, you it does have some credence in your in your life, yeah. you know. Uh, in terms of taking stock, you've had a very interesting path to Hollywood. <laughs> I have. Uh, not the usual. <laughs> not the usual path. Um, amazing story. You started out as a dancer. I did. Uh, um, from the time you were seven, well seven, into your 30s, right? Right. Um, what was it about dancing that made you, know, you... I don't know. Ever since when I was... My mother said that I was dancing in the crib. Hmm. And uh, I always had... You know, it was like something within me that... I just wanted to dance, and at that point, it wasn't about uh, it wasn't about performing because I didn't know about performing at that young age. All I knew is that I needed to express myself, and um, I can remember when I was seven years old. Um, I I was raised in St. Louis, born in St. Louis, and we had a library next door to a there was a dance studio next door to a public library and so my mom would take me to the library and every time i passed the dance studio i would always say mom you know can i go in can i take dancing lessons you know i was constantly asking for that mm. and finally one day she gave in and she said okay if this is something you want to do you need to do it yourself and and i was very believe it or not, shy child. <laughs> and I had to, this is one of those, if you see the movie, it's a core memory for me. Okay, yeah. Um, because I had to climb up on a stool to get the phone book down, look it up. At seven years old, I had to find the name of the studio, look it up, call the number. It was a big deal for me. Yeah. <laughs> and it made an impression on me. <laughs> and I spoke to my dancing teacher's husband and I can remember everything about it, and I had to ask how much it cost and when I could come. And um, so she knew I was serious at seven that I wanted to do it. That's a good way to test if a kid is serious, I think. Yeah, if you make them do it themselves, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so that's the start of your journey as a performer. In the 70s, you were a cheerleader for the I St. Know. Louis. Uh, I know. Uh, what, that's pretty terrific. I love football. Yeah. So I had the best of both worlds. I was dancing. I could watch the game at a really wonderful perspective, plus have a lot of cute guys around, which they kept us pretty separated from the football players. Really? They entered on one end of the stadium, we entered at the other, and they try not to have our paths cross, but <laughs> it, Was it like a history of problems uh, before? I don't know about before, but it must have happened before because it didn't happen with us. <laughs> so, uh, and then your dancing career continued. You had time as a as a burlesque dancer. Yes, but let's let's really um, let's say that uh, let's there was paint no, that picture accurately. no yes, okay. let's paint it accurately. There was no stripping involved. It was the old time burlesque with uh, the the um, uh, the old skits and the one liners, and um, and we just had. Very pretty, strategically fa uh, placed feathers and g-strings. <laughs> so, what did you learn about comedy in that kind I of vaudeville act? I was really great, uh, fortunate, I should say. Not, I wasn't great, but I was fortunate <laughs> that um, I worked was fortunate enough to work with people who had been in the business for many, many years. One being Will Be Able, who actually uh, started Baggy Pants Burlesque, and then. Uh, there were a couple of companies, and I ended up working with the Mercer Brothers and another company, and they'd been in the business since they were, um, golly, into the 1930s. Wow. And so uh, Jim Jim Mercer was James Cagney's stand-in dancer in Yankee Doodle Dandy. Okay. And Bud and Jim both uh, danced in all the, the musicals uh, right after the war, uh, after World War II. And, and I was... One was a straight and one was the comic, and I got to stand on the sidelines and, uh, and actually observe the two of them plus work. You know, I, either I was being their straight at times or hmm. so. 
So you must have learned a lot about timing. I learned from the best, yeah. From the best. Uh, exactly, the timing. Their timing was impeccable. And they also had such a gift of working with the live audience of how to handle a heckler or whatever was – or, you know, if somebody was sitting there with a straight face and not responding at all, they knew how to deal with that. Hmm. And so I was able to learn from from that, you know. So after that, you moved to L.A. to become an actor. Mm-hmm. And no. you found – well, actually, I came. I'm sorry. I don't mean to no, no, correct no. you. No, Please I, correct. This is your uh, timeline. No, 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 no. Yeah. I we came to LA to revamp the show. Okay. Um, and in the in the course of revamping the show, um, I had an injury, and the two older gentlemen, the Ber- Mercer brothers, Bud and Jim, ended up getting a job in Reno. So with them in Reno and me with a knee injury, um, it kind of changed my path. So I had to find a job. We actually came, you know, to revamp that show, not okay. to necessarily be an actor. So you found yourself in L.A. thinking, I need a different career. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, first of all, I was at the older end of the spectrum for a dancer. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it's a little more difficult to, to compete with a 19, 20-year-old when you're in your mid to latter 30s. So uh, Time to think of exit strategy yeah, anyways. Right. And I think that... Um, the universe knew that it would be very difficult for me to, to like just stop, you know, dancing. And so it gave me a little push and, um, I had a, a, had to have knee surgery and stuff. So it kind of gave me the, the push in another direction. And, and that ended up doing jobs to pay money, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I was a receptionist at an aerospace defense company. Um, I worked at a movie theater. I sold tickets at a movie theater. Anything to pay my my uh, rent, my car insurance, and my health insurance. Hmm. <laughs> and so. And you found yourself at one point on the other side of the table doing casting. Yeah. Well, how that turned about this uh, again, not really typical. Mm-hmm. I was the receptionist at the aerospace defense company. A friend of mine said, "Hey, Phyllis, they want a mousy woman." For it was a court show, and um, they said he said just get in the car and go. And oh, in L.A., you know, you have to go what's called from the valley over the hill to Hollywood. And I only had an hour for lunch, and I said, mm, I don't think I can make it. I can't think I can make it over and back. And I didn't want to be late from my real job that was paying my bills. And he said, just get in the car and go. And I went okay. And so. And in the old days, we used to wear nylons. <laughs> and um, in the haste of trying to get over to this audition, I didn't just rip uh, a runner in my nylons. I ripped the entire, pulling them up, I ripped the entire knee out of it. And um, so I walked into the audition and I said, excuse me, are you looking for a mousy woman or a tacky woman? And I raised my skirt and shoulder my nylon. And... Um, we hit it off. I didn't get the role. I wasn't mousy enough. But in the course of that audition and conversation, um, I said, you know, I think I might be good in casting. I just have a hunch. Hmm. And a year later, um, this lady called me and offered me the op- an opportunity to uh, be in casting. Started out on the hmm. lowest rung of the totem pole, doing everything that anybody ever needed, <laughs> you know, in casting. Yeah. And so was there 19 years. 19 years. So initially, though, you wanted to be in acting. Was it a bit of a disappointment or did I, you just... No, I... Well, when I stopped dancing, I, we took, I took a couple of commercial classes, uh-huh. thinking, you know, having been told that I had a commercial look. So I tried to do that, but it never really panned out. And, I, and my nine-to-five job didn't really lend itself to going on auditions. So I actually just kind of thought that that had left the, you know, mm-hmm. my my little world and um, was Settle. completely surprised when it came back to uh, invite me back in. <laughs> okay, before we get to that mm-hmm. next serendipitous turn, yes. what did you learn from casting in terms of reading lines with other actors? I think that's where I actually... Um, honed a craft that I wasn't even realizing that I was doing when I was reading with actors. Uh, I mean, simple things um, like how to hold a, a pair of sides when you're, when you're auditioning, mm-hmm. um, how to, um, when looking at a person, and I, I had to immediately 
like judge the situation. I had to see physically if they fit the role. Um, also, when they opened their mouth, if they're if if there were if the role was calling for an edge, if they had that just built in them, or where they were where they were actually pulling up their their emotion from. Hmm. And so, um, also honesty. I think you know it, when you read hundreds of pre- people for one role, and all of a sudden. A lot of times it will be this not good or bad. It's just kind of the same middle of the road. And then that one person walks in who brings a believability to it that um, didn't surface. Just makes it feel real. Oh, it is real. It's absolutely real. Hmm. And you know it immediately. So you're developing all those instincts unknowingly. Yeah, unknowingly. (laughs) I wasn't like consciously sitting there going, oh, let's see now. Uh, You know. And then, fatefully, one of your casting jobs uh, was for the producers of a new show called The Office. Yes. And what happened next? Well, with that, um, actually, the whole process of The Office was slightly different than the norm. Uh, usually, at at this point in the process, uh, we would be pairing the actors up, and we didn't we wouldn't be putting them on tape. We would actually audition them and take them to a network um, and have them audition in front of the executives. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Greg Daniels, the um, executive producer of The Office, dis- and the casting director and everyone involved decided that that was not the the format that we needed to go. So they actually um, rented a space, created an office in there, had them to be put on tape. Um, and so it was the second day of the, of of that part of the process. We were trying to pair up the Pam, the Jims and the Dwights Mm -hmm. to see if they had any kind of chemistry. And the, uh, director, uh, Kim, Ken Quapis said, Phyllis, I want you to read the character of Pam. And I can remember distinctly, I was walking across the room, my intent of that moment was to try and make sure everybody had their coffee and we were going to get started on time and everybody mm-hmm. was here. And I went, okay. <laughs> and I was a little concerned because um, I, my boss, Allison Jones, I didn't know if... That's the ca- casting director? Yes, okay. she's above me. I've mm-hmm. worked for her. And I wasn't sure if she was aware that he had asked me to do this and I, I didn't want to st- overstep my, you know, a line there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I hesitantly said, okay. Um, I was nervous about it because I didn't want, uh, not only for her, but I was nervous about the actors. I didn't want, I wanted to do the best that I could for them. And I wasn't aware that he was auditioning me. That's the weird part about the whole thing. <laughs> and, and no one in the powers that be ever came to me and said, hey, Phyllis, would you like to be in the show or would you like to be in show business? That never was said. And about two weeks later, wardrobe called me. <laughs> and um, I had been having been in casting long enough, I knew that uh, being sent to script or wardrobe calling constituted a work call. And they said, I understand you're playing the character of Phyllis. And I said, yes, I am. Hmm. So, yeah. Uh, I'm I'm happy to not have, be aware of the fact that he was auditioning me. I was glad to be clueless. I was about to say, why do you think he kind of kept you in the dark? I guess for that reason. I guess uh. he wanted the. I mean, I never really asked him that question, um, but I guess he just wanted to keep it. In, I guess he felt that it would be an added uh, level level of anxiety had I known. Mm. You know. And how long did it take in the role of Phyllis Vance for you to say to yourself, I'm an actress. I'm, I'm a good actress. Oh, well, I never said good. <laughs> I can say that. Uh, because every script was, every, every time we'd get a new script, you know, uh, as an actor, you look at your work and you, and you try to, to bring something, you know, different or, or, or at least consistent with what the character has been written. So hmm. I never really said good. I can honestly say that too. <laughs> you know, but did it take it's a always while a to, challenge. Yeah. Did it take a while to give yourself permission to say, I, yeah, I deserve yeah, to I'm, be? I have yeah. a new career yeah. and I'm an actor. Yeah, absolutely. Like nine yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, since you've gone on to have more roles, this is your first uh, voiceover, My right? first voiceover. Yeah. Uh, what's uh, What does it mean to be living all these dreams at this at this point, it's 
I, I'm very grateful, mm. really. Uh, the word is thankful, grateful, um, and sometimes in disbelief uh, that that the innermost part of my being. Um, I, I can tell you this: part of part of what um, happened with me is that I used to pray every day when I went to work. And my parents were getting elderly, and they lived in St. Louis, and I was in L.A. And um, I would say, I don't know how I'm going to do this because I had my casting career, Mm -hmm. and I didn't know how I was going to be able to take care of them and be by mid-coastal. And I said in a prayer once, I said, I don't know how we're going to do this. Help me win the lottery or something. And I did just in an unconventional way. So it was a prayer answered, and um, uh, I have a whole new whole new lease on life, actually. What does it make you think when you look back at all these serendipitous turns, the things you picked up and learned all along the way that you I, could, you must have had no idea it was all no, adding no, had, up to something? I had no idea. I, the only my intent was to to be the best that I could possibly be in whatever I did. And I think that in, I think that's part, partially instilled from my parents. You know, my I never wanted to let them down. I never wanted to disappoint them. And uh, so I think that. Excuse me. No, no problem. Um, I think that was my intent, and uh, I hope that they're proud. Can't imagine uh, how they wouldn't be. But uh, everything I did was about. Regardless, you know, I was taught to to be the best that you could, and uh, uh, so whether whether I was selling movie tickets or or you know sitting behind a desk at the office, uh, that's what I wanted. So as far as this, I just I really think that um, God had a better plan than I ever anticipated for myself, and I'm just happy. Well, you've certainly brought a lot of joy to a lot of people, myself included. So thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the new film. It's excellent. Yeah, thank you.